I'm peaceful cause I decide to be I control my thoughts and anxiety My body's nervous as she should be And I radiate love with fluently I am worthy of greater things I'm an angel, just look at these wings I am ready to receive I see the light cause it shine on me Shine on me uh. Hi, I'm Danny Elliott and this is First Time for Everything a podcast where I talk with really interesting people from all walks of life about their first time doing something. These people started out just like you and me, interested in something and wanting to try it. Maybe they were a little bit scared, but something in them made them take that leap towards their dream. I hope these conversations inspire you to step out of your comfort zone and go after whatever it is you've been wanting to do. And who knows, maybe we'll be talking about your first time someday soon. Hi, first timers. I'm bringing an episode to you today that is very close to my heart, but maybe difficult for some people to listen to. So I just wanted to preface this episode with a trigger warning about miscarriage. I go into detail sharing my story and it might not be for everyone. So I just wanted to let you know that before you hit play. This is such a layered topic and I feel it's so important to spread awareness about because for as common as it is, it's not discussed very much. I wanted to do this episode to help other women going through miscarriage to know that they are not alone and also wanted to do this for anyone supporting a woman going through miscarriage to shed some light on what she might be experiencing and how she can be supported. We are so lucky to have OBGYN Dr. Shiva Gofrani as our guest today. She is a phenomenal woman who I admire so much and who is a true leader in her field. You can really feel the love she has for the work that she does and the people that she treats. Dr. Gofrani shares her story of having six miscarriages to having three beautiful children to caring for women who come through her practice who are experiencing pregnancy loss. I really hope this episode is insightful, helpful, and most of all, comforting for anyone who has been looking for stories just like I was to help them feel less alone in this process. You may have also noticed we have a special theme song today. This song is called Affirmations by one of my vocal coaching clients, the endlessly talented Gray Ziegler. The lyrics to the song have helped me so much in my healing process that I actually made it my alarm, so it's the first message I hear every day. Also, Gray knows Shiva from Connecticut, so we're just a bunch of full circle Connecticut girls dominating this entire episode. (laughs) Without further ado, this is first time experiencing a miscarriage. Thank you, Shiva, so much for being here. I really, really appreciate you taking time out of your insane schedule to to spend time with us on first time for everything. I love you, I'm flattered, and I have to just give a shout out to anyone listening that the amazing Danny uh, taught my daughter singing lessons that my daughter, of course, did not continue because that's her, but she (laughs) and was enamored by Danny. So anyone who hasn't seen her would now understand why if you see her because she is beautiful. So she is a, she is a treasure and she is so I meant you, but she is a treasure too. (laughs) But yeah, if, uh, if she ever feels like she gets the singing bug again, I'm here, but I loved working with her so much. Well, yeah. So today we are tackling a very layered topic that I know when I was texting you about this, I was, um, it took a lot for me to be like, okay, girl, you just got it. You got to do this. And I feel like typically when it's something I'm scared to do, it's the universe being like, you know, you need to do it, bitch. Like, you know. <laughs> yes. no. Yeah. So, um, so today we're going to be talking about miscarriage, and um, I know that um, you've shared your story. Uh, about your miscarriages and I've shared some of my story on Instagram about mine Um, but I know when especially in the the first one uh, I had such a hard time finding any resources that felt really honest and very raw a lot of it felt very um, kind of sugar-coated even the 
the place where I was getting care didn't really prepare me for what happened with my miscarriage. And I know now I know every miscarriage is like very different for each person. Um, mine was pretty traumatic, um, especially the first one. And um, I was just not ready at all. And it, it felt so difficult to find um, just sources where I could relate and be like, oh, okay, like someone else has also had like this horrific thing happen to them. And so, uh, yeah, I thought that this would be best kind of uh, done with your professional insight and personal insight too, if you feel comfortable sharing mm -hmm. your kind of journey. But, um, but yeah, so I guess maybe first we'll start out with, if you just want to give everybody a bat your, your background, kind of like how you got into OBGYN work, that would be awesome. I will give you the short version, which is <laughs> I did not do any pre-meds as an undergrad. I did several different majors that were mostly liberal arts. And then truly out of lack of knowing what I wanted to do next, I, I, I needed something. My parents had both been doctors. They did not push us towards it because they didn't want us to do it unless we really loved it. And I was going to graduate in six months. And I honestly thought, okay, well, let me just start taking pre-meds so I have something to do. And if I have to be a doctor, I know that I can work hard and I would imagine I'll like it. Let's try it. I mean, it was literally that, that is what happened. I wish I had some amazing grandiose, like I was passionate from a young age of healing, but I was not. I was passionate from a young age of like engaging and connecting. I didn't realize that so much at the time, but that's what I really loved. And thank God I picked medicine because it's just become a great medium with which I got to connect and engage, but it's not the medicine or the science or frankly, even the healing exactly that I love. It's engaging and through my engaging, I feel like I've gotten to heal. And actually yeah. today, after you and I texted and I had told you that I had been um, talking to a, a woman who has just been through a, a few pretty traumatic pregnancy losses herself. Ironically, um, Parker Palmer, I don't know if you know that name, but he is a writer, he's 80 something. He is, um, or he's written books, I should say. He is a clergyman of sorts and it's a, interesting story that my twin nephews had told me to read this book. Um, it was kind of a spiritual type of book that they, they and I discuss a lot. They're 22 today. And that book happened to be in my on-call bag that I take back and forth to the hospital when I'm going to the hospital. And this morning I thought, oh, I'm probably not going to need my bag. Let me leave the book. I happened to look at the book. It reminded me that the book was the book that my twin nephews, who are 22 today, gave me. I, lo I get into my car. I turn on my podcasts to like figure, look at what I'm going to listen to for my 15-minute drive. Yeah. And a podcast with that particular writer comes up. This what? is not a new book. I mean, there was, this is definitely, again, the universe telling me we're all connected. And then what he said was so perfect and poignant for like me getting to talk to this patient or me getting to talk to you or anyone in this audience, that when any of us has gone through something, whether it's tragic or just traumatic or emotional or something that we didn't ever think we could or wanted to go through, what makes it um, special to us and what gives it any kind of credence is our ability to kind of offer it up to someone else. And mm -hmm. that's what makes it worth it. And I've often, often said all the things I've been through, my six miscarriages, my oldest child who had an intrauterine stroke, my ovarian cancer, my weight loss surgery, all those things, each individually sucked, right? Like I'm not going to sugarcoat any of those and act like they were amazing journeys with which I could come and yeah. bear fruit. They weren't. Each of them sucked so badly in so many different ways, emotionally, physically, all the things. And yet now I know on the other side and even during some of them, I knew that there was some magic. I'm sorry. I You're so good. Go, go for it. Well, Shiva had to jump off because a patient was having a baby and that is the nature of being a doctor. Uh, so that is very exciting that she's gonna help bring a baby into the world today. Um, I thought I would record this just in case um, I didn't feel like getting into the details maybe um, with Shiva and maybe um, creating some space for her to share more of her story when we talk together. Um, but I'm gonna record this now to share um, just in case I get emo. <laughs> I've been in a really good place lately, but that's the funny thing about miscarriage is that um, it kind of just comes up out of nowhere. I think like any kind of grief, it presents itself. And uh, sometimes you can just be having a totally fine or great day and then something 
just comes in. Um, but generally, I, I have been feeling really good lately. Uh, so hopefully we'll get through this great. If not, I have an entire roll of toilet paper here to, <laughs> to uh, wipe the makeup. But um, So I'm just going to give an outline of my story, uh, my first miscarriage specifically. I've had two. Um, as you heard Shiva say, she's had six. She has three healthy, beautiful children now, which is so incredible. But yeah, so my journey to having kids has been very layered. Uh, I never wanted kids. Very adamantly, anyone you ask will tell you like, Danny does not want kids. That was up until a few years ago. Um, and I think that I, I'm a musician by trade. I had been touring for years. It just didn't seem like that lifestyle really made sense for me to have children, um, being away for long stretches of time. Um, also financially, it's very ebb and flow. Um, and when it's ebbing, it's really ebbing and it's hard enough to take care of myself and my fam my husband and my dog, you know, uh, <laughs> let alone thinking of taking care of a kid. But anyway, I decided to get out of touring as much as I had been and started building my vocal coaching business uh, here in Nashville and also just around the country um, with virtual clients and started to be more financially stable. I also started to really work on some emotional things I had not really realized were issues for me, some familial stuff that I needed to heal. And I started to realize that maybe I did want to have this experience. And I, I felt like the only reason I wasn't doing it was because I was afraid. And I'm not somebody who's not going to do something because I'm afraid. Typically, I just jump in and figure it out as I go. So, um, so yeah, I got I had had an IUD for like 14 years, which uh, I think most medical professionals will tell you not to have one for that long. Uh, I had a copper one that should have been in for about 10 years, but I was like, we'll just leave her in there. She's been great. So, so I got that removed and I got pregnant very quickly. So um, I had had it out for about three months and then was like, okay, I think I'm ready to try and got pregnant. I was shocked by my reaction to finding out I was pregnant and that it was immediate joy. And I didn't think that was how I was gonna feel, but I just felt so excited and just thrilled. And I, I think that really overwhelmed me but I had this sense of peace that just came over me that was like, yeah, you can you can do this. Like, you are capable of doing this. And um, yeah, I told my husband on his 40th birthday and it was just a really special time. And it's, I think, one of the most beautiful days we've ever experienced together. And um, it, uh, it makes me really happy to think about it. Um, these are happy tears. <laughs> Um, I feel really lucky that we were able to have that moment together of just that kind of blind um, naivete, you know, and thinking that like, okay, because we had always said if it was meant to happen, it would happen. If it wasn't, it wasn't. We were okay with that. So I think we thought like, oh, wow, it happened so quickly. It must be meant to be, you know. Um, so I felt great. I felt really good. The, my main sort of pregnancy symptom was my boobs were like so painfully sore and swollen. Um, and I was like starting to like bloat a bit basically, or I just looked bloated. Um, at the time, this was like June 2020, July 2020. Um, so a lot of um, OBs weren't seeing you in person until like your eight week scan because they were trying to limit um, contact and keep pregnant women as safe as possible. Um, so I had just had a consultation at around six weeks uh, over the phone and um, then two days before we were supposed to get, go in for our scan, which happened to be at about like nine and a half weeks, just based on scheduling, um, I started spotting. And a spotting can be a very normal part of early pregnancy, as I've learned, um, but this started getting darker and brown, and um, then I eventually started seeing like clumps of dark brown blood and cramping. 
And um, I just had this gut feeling that I was miscarrying. Uh, my mom had three miscarriages before she was able to have me. And it didn't actually like shock me that I thought this was happening um, because of just my mom's history. Also, I have Hashimoto's, which is a thyroid condition. Um, and I thought that it was being managed with my provider at the time. So I didn't really think that that was a problem. Also, I was able to get pregnant so quickly. So I didn't really think that my thyroid, my thyroid was still an issue. Um, so they, my provider was able to get me in. They did an uh, intravaginal ultrasound, which is um, where they put the ultrasound device into your vagina as opposed to on your stomach. Because when it's that early in the pregnancy, they can't really see it through just like um, the device they would use on your stomach. And the technician didn't really say anything. Um, she was like, I'm just gonna get the doctor and um, but I saw when she pulled the ultrasound device out that it was just like covered in way too much blood. And I just kind of knew. And Matt was being, you know, trying to be positive this whole time. And the doctor came in and just was like, you know, um, I'm, I'm so sorry, but there's no heartbeat. And the baby is only measuring at about six weeks. And I was about nine and a half weeks along at that point. So. Um, between those two things, uh, they were like, you're having a miscarriage. And then they told me that I might bleed for like the next three weeks or so, and that was it. There was no other information that they gave me. Uh, they were like, we can either do a DNC, which is a dilogen curatage, which is where um, you go under anesthesia and they go in and basically clean your uterus out and um, they can do genetic testing on the like uh, depending on what stage you're at like the sac the embryo the fetus and tell you if there are any genetic abnormalities that caused the uh, miscarriage but I had already started miscar miscarrying so I figured I would just let it naturally happen and so they sent me home and it was a, a terrible day. I mean, but at, at the same time, we were both like, okay, my body recognized that something wasn't right and it recognized what it needed to do. And that's kind of like incredible when you, when you think about it, but at the same time, it doesn't make you feel any better. And so I just like kind of you're you're like it's like emotional ping pong you know it's like you find out you're pregnant you start thinking about your future and planning immediately and then you find out you're not pregnant and then all of that goes away and you're just supposed to like be the same person you were which which sounds like easy enough because it's like oh it was like two and a half months ago but so much has happened in your train of thought in those two and a half months that you feel like like who am I <laughs> right now and um, so anyway, that, that night I woke up at around one in the morning and was bleeding very heavily and was in the most pain I've ever been in in my life. Um, like, And I have a pretty high tolerance for pain. I couldn't even talk through these cramps. And it just felt like someone was inside of my uterus just like squeezing as hard as possible. And I was passing blood clots that were probably about the size of like a half dollar um, pretty regularly. And I also had constant diarrhea. And I, um, it was just a lot of bodily fluids. Um, and I'm not saying this to, to be like dramatic or TMI or anything, but the thing is no one told me that that was gonna happen. And I didn't know what was happening and I, it really scared me and I was feeling really weak and shaky and I was finally able to get a hold of someone from the um, provider I was seeing and they were like well your hormones are dropping or basically very quickly and that's why you have diarrhea kind of like if, if you ever get diarrhea um, when you're uh, when you have your period it's like from a hormonal shift but this was just constant and it was like blood at the same time and i was just kind of stuck to the toilet you're basically having a version of of labor it's that level of cramping and pain 
And um, that went on for about three hours straight with no break. And then um, I felt this like pop and I knew that it was the sack. And Matt had gone out of the bathroom at the time to like get me some water and like a banana and just something to like up my blood sugar and help keep me like from passing out. Um, and I, I couldn't, uh, I sat there trying to think about if I wanted to look at it or not, because at that point you're like, what do I, what do I do with this? You know, um, it's not, a, it's not technically a baby, but it, it, it's my baby and I wanted it to be a baby and it feels like, what, what do you, what do you do? You know? <laughs> um, and it's like, you're not going to stick your hand in there and take it out and then flushing it feels crazy. Um, but you really don't have any other option. And I think that, um, that was probably the most, uh, traumatic moment um was just like having to let go of it like it was just uh, like any normal time you would be on the toilet um and um matt did it for me um and then i uh, that was awful um but then uh, after that, the cramping kind of came down a lot and I stopped having the diarrhea and um, I just basically like slept from exhaustion. And um, we called both of our parents the next day. They didn't even know that I had been pregnant because we were waiting um, to tell them until the end of the first trimester which I think um everybody like you you should make your own decisions about when you want to tell people but I feel like it was almost worse that we hadn't told them because we had to call and tell them I had had a miscarriage and they were like wait so you guys were trying to get pregnant and like we didn't even know and now like it's this and they just felt horrible for us but anyway we had those conversations and then at around 3 4 o'clock the cramping started again and I went through another like three hours of the clotting and that level of pain again and that was the worst of it I would say those two sets of like three hour um windows of time and uh Basically, after that, physically, I led to varying degrees, mostly kind of mildly to lightly for the next month. Luckily, my period came back like a month to the day of my miscarriage, um, and my cycle became like really steady. But the provider I had been seeing at the time also didn't tell me about any of the fallout, like the physical symptoms. Um, and again, like everybody's miscarriage situations are very different. Like my mom's was like how they had said, she just kind of spotted or like bled for like a month. She didn't have this really intense experience like I did. And yeah, everyone is just so different. But for me, um, and I just, I have a lot of notes here. So if I'm not looking at you for anyone watching this on YouTube, um, I'm just going back and forth between my notes. I'm sure I'm gonna forget stuff anyway, but in addition to bleeding for that month, while I was healing, it kind of felt like my insides were kind of floating around. Like if I jumped, it felt like my uterus would kind of like move a bit. Uh, so it felt weird to exercise at all. Uh, so I really had to take my time getting back into doing that. Um, I had headaches for about six weeks straight uh, from just the hormones coming down. I never have headaches, very luckily. I've ne That's never been a, an issue for me. And so that was really disconcerting, having headaches that regularly for that long. I subsequently had another miscarriage um, in January of 2021. And I would say from that time on, I was also bloated for about nine months after that. Um, I had um, 
ultrasound was done to make sure that everything was okay. But yeah, it was just my body just kind of stayed in the shape it had been in during the pregnancy. And basically through all of this, I developed extreme health anxiety um, for basically all of 2021. I developed this chronic pain in my uh, like upper left ribs kind of behind my left breast that felt like I was either having a heart attack or like an asthma attack depending on the severity of it. It would just come really randomly and go randomly. Um, there was no rhyme or reason to it. I've had this pinched nerve in my left shoulder blade on and off for years, but it became like a chronic issue last year. I would feel dizzy. I would get numbness in my arms and legs, um, seemingly for no reason. These are just some of the, the things that would happen. Um, and I basically developed this like massive distrust of my body and it felt like the further out I got from the miscarriages the more scared and angry I was um, it went from kind of appreciating that my body could get pregnant and recognizing what it needed to do when it wasn't working out to just being like why can't I do this why doesn't my body want to do this and I think the other thing that didn't help my health anxiety was that I had been trying really hard to focus in on my thyroid health and heal that and um, my numbers just kept coming back like every six weeks to eight weeks poorly and not where they needed to be and so it just became really confusing as to why my body just like was doing this and we'll get into more of the physical side of things and I would love to get Shiva's input on this when we get her back on the call and then we'll also get into the sort of like emotional psychological processing of it and also healing too but that's my physical story what happened to me personally again everybody's situation is different there are going to be some people who have an experience like mine or worse and people who have an experience that is very mild not like mine at all but again my goal in sharing this and I'm sure I'm opening myself up to all of the internet's opinions but I really honestly don't care. My goal in sharing this is to have this be out there for anyone who was desperately searching for someone to relate to because that was me and when I was sitting on the toilet having miscarriage I was trying to google information about miscarriages, stories about women having miscarriages like mine and I found two over the course of like a long time it took me to find that and other than that it was just very glossed over information so you are not alone if you are listening to this um, this is one of the worst things that I think any woman can go through you're allowed to feel however you want to feel about it I know that some people feel relief um, because maybe they weren't ready to be pregnant but that still doesn't take away from the trauma of the experience I know some people are devastated. I think uh, you can feel both of those things. You're allowed to let this change how you feel about being pregnant and how you feel about even trying again to get pregnant if that's something that you want. Um, just know that any feeling that you have is valid and um, we'll bring Shiva back in for the next uh, part of this episode and uh, get some of her awesome advice. She is such a wealth of knowledge and she's one of the first people I found online that really helped me feel understood and also educated me a lot to just how our bodies work, why miscarriages can happen. She shared her story in a, um, a multi-part series on Instagram about her six miscarriages. And she's such an incredible, incredible resource for women's health. So we'll bring her back in here. But um, yeah, that's my story so far. Well, let's pick up where we left off that last time um, Danny and I were 
videoing. And yeah. then all of a sudden I had to run out. It was a very, it was quiet at the hospital. Nothing was happening. And I suddenly got a phone call from one of the residents saying this patient showed up, she was bleeding. So basically she was 34 weeks. It was her first pregnancy. She had a placenta previa, which is where the placenta is sitting on top of the cervix. And she started bleeding pretty heavily. And so we had to do an emergency C-section. And I say that all because it sounds so the word that I hate that all the women use, it sounds so scary, which yeah, legitimately, yeah. I mean, in that moment, obviously a woman bleeding heavily at 34 weeks, we jump to attention. Like we need our adrenaline to kick in as like the doctors and nurses. Um, but I say it all because she's great. She's fine. She's perfect. She's healthy. And that was two ish weeks ago, a little over two weeks ago. And that baby is going home. Like if not yesterday, maybe I might, cause I haven't talked to her in a couple of days, but yesterday or like in the next two or three days. Um, and she had an uncomplicated emergent C-section mm -hmm. that ended up okay. The baby had to go to the NICU because he was preterm, but he had to go just for routine things. Nothing, nothing devastating, nothing scary. Like she and he will be perfectly fine. So I say all that so that one of the threads that we can kind of discuss is that in the midst of everything happening to any of, of you or of all of us from a health perspective, I think it's really easy to get mired in the anxiety of like, this must mean something tragic after. Yes. And sometimes it does. Obviously, I don't live in a world where I don't see tragedy, but the good news is the majority of time, it doesn't ultimately mean death, destruction, tragedy. It means this sucked. We should, you know, process what is terrible and also keep our wits about us that even within something being terrible, the outcome is probably going to be okay. Yeah. So. No, that's such a good, that's such a good point. Cause that's something, um, at that we'll definitely get into in this. I, I definitely want to pick your brain about and share my experience with that because I, I ended up going into like a very catastrophe minded mindset for so long after my miscarriages. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like only the last few months have I started to kind of come out of that and really like believe that there could be a different outcome and yeah. also like truly believe that like, this is just a, a period in my life. Like it's yes. not forever, mm -hmm. you it's know? not forever, but it feels yeah. like it. And I know it does. That's why I yeah. think it's so valuable to hear these stories ahead of time. Like my hope for you, for your platform and, and all of our platforms is that Women seek them once they've gone through something, of course, but in an ideal world, wouldn't it be great if they could hear it preemptively so that yeah. they could say, oh, this might happen. And guess what? Many of these women are on the other side after things that they thought were going to be really catastrophic, right? Yeah, totally. Well, I guess that being said, um, like, would you mind talking about your, um, since the podcast is called First Time for Everything, I thought we could talk about our first miscarriages, if that ties into you're, you're um, following yeah. miscarriages, but yeah, if you feel comfortable sharing yeah. whatever details you want. Oh, Danny, you're so cute. I feel comfortable sharing everything. Yeah. <laughs> All of it. Also, it's too hard. I've always joked. It's too hard for me to ever remember like what I've told people and what I haven't. So it's easier to just tell everybody everything. I do the um, same thing. Right? I, I just, I can't edit that much. It's challenging. I also never want people to feel left out. So I'm, I always like reintroduce people all the time because I never want anyone to feel like I'm not thinking of them. They're like, we are friends outside of you now. Like stop introducing. <laughs> well, this is not revolve around you, but I love that you think that you feel that because you're not doing it out of like narcissism. Yeah, no. Out of beautiful like feeling of collaboration. I love that. Um, okay. So, I mean, my journey actually started, I think a lot like many women, which is I was, well, I was a little bit older than many women, but actually the same age as many, many of my patients. So I was 34. My husband and I had gotten married at 29. I was a resident for four years. I, so actually I take it back. I was 34 when I had my first child. I was 32 when I decided to go off the pill during residency and just see what happened. But see what happened to me legitimately meant we would have to try to get pregnant because I just was working a lot. We frankly weren't even having that much sex. Yeah, and we got pregnant by surprise and that, you know, and when I say by surprise, meaning we weren't using protection. So I wasn't shocked. I just didn't think yeah. it would be that quick. And I was not in great health, meaning I had worked a lot. I was stressed. I was mildly hypertensive, mostly because I was about 200 pounds at the time. And so it was very kind of, I hate to say lifestyle related. It wasn't a blame or shame thing, but it was just based on, you know, what I was doing in my life at the time. And when we found out I was pregnant, there was that millisecond of, oh gosh, is this the right time for me right now? Mm -hmm. And I, I say that very openly because I think what then happens and I see it in my patients' eyes and faces and demeanor all the time is that first millisecond, I was like, ah, oh. and then that second millisecond, 
was excitement, like to see that positive test. And then of course, like most women, I probably took five more tests, which is a joke. We all pee about five times on those sticks. And then we put them in a Ziploc bag and then you find it 10 years later and you're like, what do I do with it? Do I throw them out? I don't know. It feels weird to throw them out. Who knows? Which pregnancy was this? I don't know. Uh, Within four weeks, I, well, I, within four weeks, I had miscarried, but within that first week, because I was a resident, because I was impatient, mm-hmm. I actually did an ultrasound on myself, like in the oh, middle of the night, wow. at the hospital, in the clinic, when I knew that all I should be able to see was just a, what's called a gestational sac, just like a little bubble of fluid in the, flu- in the uterus. It was too early to see anything else. And I saw that, but it just, something about it looked a little bit off to me, like the, the shape of it, the size of it was a little bit off. And I thought I'll tell myself what I will tell my patients, which is we're going to be patient. It's still too early. Yeah. Wait a week or two. Was and on like six weeks, I was at that point, five weeks. Cause the day you miss your period, technically, if you're having a typical 25 to 30 day period, the day you miss your period and have your positive test, you're technically four weeks pregnant, meaning two weeks about from when you've ovulated and gotten pregnant. So this was within a week. So I was five weeks pregnant. Shouldn't have seen anything more than a sack. I saw the sack, but it looked irregular. And the truth is, I'm glad that I can't recall all the details right now, meaning at the time, as you know, I could have told you the details like Thursday night, 8 p.m. My first yes. ultrasound, I saw a sack. You yes. know, one week later, I had brown spotting for two seconds. I knew all the details at the time. Now, I'm so glad I can tell you. I actually remember so few of the actual details because the end result of all this, just to continue to um, talk about things openly and be able to process things without sugarcoating it, but also remind everyone listening that the end result will be okay. Cause PS now I have three children as a joke, more children than I can handle um, <laughs> six miscarriages, three children later, but that one ended up, I bled a lot. The sack did not go away on its own in the ensuing, like one or two weeks, I had to go to my gynecologist and he had to perform like a tiny little suction situation in his office to try to get it out, which was so painful. I mean, just all the things, like it was painful. I felt like I was going to pass out. I was like in the middle of my day. I had to like run over to his office and all the things that happened with the miscarriage. And all through that, there was that little thread in my brain that thought, oh my gosh, I know this is not true as a doctor, but is this a little bit of karmic punishment? Because Mm -hmm. I had that millisecond of not being excited. And again, I say this to anyone listening, if any of you have felt it, and I know you felt it because I've seen your faces in my office when I have to tell you that that heartbeat stopped or that we don't see the heartbeat. It is not karmic punishment. It is not because of anything other than the fact that nature is just not always so smart. And nature, unfortunately, puts together eggs and sperms that don't make their way. And and I know that. And I knew that at the time, but it was actually very informative for me to really see how our minds, especially as women, just play tricks on us and make us um, fool us into thinking things that are not there. So I really feel strongly that we should try to urge women if they feel that to just, just not, I mean, there's no other way around it other than to say, I do not believe that any being on the other side, as much as I believe in God is there to punish us. And if you were going to punish someone, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be me or most of the people listening on this. And it certainly the punishment would not be in the form of a miscarriage for merely feeling or sensing, or even verbalizing, you know, a little bit of anxiety over being pregnant or anything like that. So Yeah. So that was my first of six. And I mean, without making the story too long, basically the next five were a combination of either passed on their own, or I would try to take medication to get them to pass. The medication never worked very well for me. I had four DNCs within those six miscarriages. One of the DNCs was actually for the same pregnancy because I had some retained tissue. Each time when we sent the tissue, we couldn't confirm that the chromosomes were abnormal. So the most common reason for a miscarriage, as you know, is that the chromosomes are irregular egg and the sperm get together. They create the wrong number. I hate saying wrong, but a number that is not compatible with, with life. Um, and then you miscarry. And in my case, the ones we could test all had normal chromosomes, which just made the, the situation a little bit more confusing. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so, wow. yeah, so that was, that was the story. And I, you know, I never want to make it sound like that was it, so, you know, big deal. Like I, I moved on. Sure. <laughs> it sucked. It was terrible. I mean, it sucked. And I remember I was working as a resident and I had my own patients in the clinic and every day patients would be like, I'm pregnant. Oh my God. I didn't even mean to be. And oh my gosh. And, you know, it felt like everyone in the world was pregnant, but me and I kept miscarrying. And of course there was that part of me that thought, I can't imagine that my weight and my health and my stress doesn't have to do with this. But at the same time, I didn't have any choice in the matter. Like at that moment, there was truly, I felt no choices I could make with regard to the amount I worked. And my, my weight was out of my control, meaning, and I don't mean that in a dismissive way that like someone else could control it, but I knew that I didn't feel equipped to take care of it 
with the stress that I had. And so it was just something that I accepted. I tried to keep reminding myself what, what I try to remind patients, which is this does not mean the end of your pregnancy journey and the end of your mothering journey. But I really do understand why women feel that way. And I think that the worst part about having a miscarriage, especially with your first pregnancy, is that you somehow think it means not only is this terrible and sad, but that you'll never have a baby, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that to me was the hardest. I thought, if I know I'm going to have babies, this will be okay. It was, you know, it was sad, but I can get through it. It's the knowledge that, or the concern that this might mean I'm never going to have a baby that really stressed me out. And I think is what stresses most women out, which is why I try to really, again, encourage women to understand the vast majority of us will be able to have a baby, maybe not spontaneous pregnancy on our own, maybe not even ultimately with our own egg or our own sperm or anything like that, but we can typically have a baby. It just depends on how far we want to go. Totally. I, man, I feel so many parts of your story resonate so deeply with me, like so many crossovers for sure. And I think the whole being afraid of not being able to have a baby was, I felt that after my second one, the first one, I strangely, um, I had a lot of peace about it when, oh. when I did miscarry. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I was so like sad, but I was also like, okay, like I know that this is, nature working itself out. I'm so amazed that my body was able to get pregnant and then was able to also recognize that, hey, like this is this is also not working. So we're going to do what we need to do. Um, and it wasn't until the second miscarriage that I was like, maybe there's something wrong with me. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I think after the first one, I was like, okay, like next time I'll be ready. And then the next one happened like unexpectedly as mm -hmm. well. Like I basically like got my ovulation math incorrect. And, um, and I, my thyroid was all messed up and I didn't like have that together yet. So it was just like a mess. But, um, I just wanted to ask you when you were, um, since you've, you've passed some miscarriages naturally and then also had the DNCs, did you mm -hmm. feel like the recovery process was different between those two? Cause I've had one of each and yeah. it, it, I, I feel like I've had two different recoveries. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, and I, I'll always say this to every patient, um, every person's recovery is different based on a lot of different factors, physical, emotional, logistical. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and again, I wish I could remember even exactly which ones. Right. Like I, I remember kind of which ones, but, and that sounds, I don't mean to be dismissive of it. I say no. it and I highlight it same mm -hmm. way. I would say to like new moms where they're like, my baby only gained one ounce or four ounces. Or I remember all that with, with my daughter. Right. And now I'm like, I don't remember. I don't even know what, when she had her first word. Yeah. That's the good news. Um, so yeah, I, you know, listen, when patients are about to have, when patients are having miscarriage and I, I walk them through the three choices, wait for it to pass on its own or take medication or do a DNC. And just to specify the medication we give is either one of two things. It's either just medication that makes your uterus contract or a little bit of a newer protocol that many doctors do is giving you the medication that helps the tissue kind of detach a little bit and then your uterus contracts. And then the DNC is where you have a procedure where you're under a little bit of anesthesia so you don't feel anything um, but, and you're asleep essentially, but it's very safe. And the doctor or your nurse practitioner or PA will gently dilate the cervix and remove everything. I personally, because of the logistics of my life, I was a resident. Again, I didn't have a lot of time off. You don't get time off when you're a resident. You have to do this like on your own time. And I, um, I ended up liking the DNC more, which sounds funny to say like anything. I don't like anything, but it was more to me. It provided more predictability and more closure because yeah. I could walk in make sure that I was thankfully asleep under mild, safe anesthesia, wake up and know it was, was finished as yeah. opposed to when it passed naturally, or when I tried to use the medication, which for me, for some reason, my uterus just did not respond. Um, and that just was frustrating because that meant it took longer and I had to kind of keep waiting and I had to do more follow-up. Mm -hmm. I think each person is so different and there's thankfully no right answer not only with regard to which one's better because they're both equivalently safe, but also even the recovery. Some women feel terrible when they pass it on their own because it's prolonged pain and bleeding. Yeah. Um, and then the emotions, other women are, are lucky enough where it kind of passes swiftly on its own, not pain, painlessly, but very crampy and intense over the course of a couple of hours. And then it's done. And they're very happy to avoid the doctor's office again, or, or, you know, what they deem is surgery, even though it's not yeah. surgery, it's just a procedure. Um, so it's really different. So I feel like I can't say hormonally either one affected me differently. I was yeah. Bad for both. 
And I do luckily have a pretty good ability to compartmentalize. And again, for other reasons that are not good, I just had to get back to work, right? So for me, it didn't matter. And that, and that is something I would say to patients. I think you need to be careful when we all like, I'm, I wanted to hear your perspective and what your experience was. And I want everyone to remember that their response and their body's response, and their mind's response is going to be different than mine and yours even. And so they yeah. should really choose a little bit based on like, what is their gut feeling telling them about, about the logistics and about the closure? Because those things are important. 100%. 100%. I think um, it was really interesting for me because the first time I, I passed at home and um, the second time I had the DNC and the DNC was far less physically traumatic, but mm -hmm. I, I feel like my body has not felt the same since. Mm -hmm. um, like I have had a hard time like losing weight and like I, but yet I just had a all my hormones tested and they like couldn't be more perfect. Right. So I'm like, okay, that's good. Maybe I'm just getting thick, you know, like who knows? Like <laughs> that's okay too. Like yeah. that's great. You're very heavy, Danny. We should talk about you. <laughs> no, but you know, like for yourself, like what you're used yeah. to, like clothes fitting you a certain way. And like, um, and I also just found it interesting. I made it to about nine weeks each time mm -hmm. or so I thought, I was nine weeks. Um, and uh, even how much your body can just change in that short period of time too. I was like, this is mind blowing. <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah. Well, and let's specify for anyone listening that I know you know this, I think, but nine weeks means nine weeks from the first day of your last period, which is very confusing for women because they know the first day of their last period, but in their mind, they know that they got pregnant about two weeks later, if they're having a regular 28 ish day cycle. But again, if they're having a longer cycle, then they didn't get pregnant two weeks after the period that they got pregnant three or four weeks after. Mm -hmm. So the whole nine weeks won't make sense to, to them. Sure. Right. So yeah. just so everyone knows, when we say nine weeks by convention, we mean nine weeks from the first day of your last period, or your doctor will have seen you and measured that fetal pole. We call it. I don't know if you heard that term, Danny, but where it's like the head, the crown rump, the mm -hmm. crown rump length, we call it. it, looks like a little bean. And then the doctor can say, oh, this is actually how many weeks we're saying you are. And yeah. again, even when the doctor tells you how many weeks you are, that's still a measurement that is translating as if you had a period nine weeks ago, because by yeah. convention, it's always going to be 40 weeks from the first day of your last period is what we consider typical pregnancy. And that can be very confusing. And actually, I found that to be a big source of um, discontent when women are having early pregnancy, either just not, we don't know if it's a viable pregnancy or when they're having a miscarriage because the confusion of, I'm confused why you're telling me it's only measuring seven weeks when I'm really nine weeks, or why are you telling me it's nine weeks when I know I got pregnant six weeks ago? And yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, to save time, I've edited out going through my story with Shiva here because I shared it with you all already in the first part of this episode. So we're going to jump back in towards the end of my story where Shiva starts to give us some more medical feedback and insight and explains pregnancy timelines and terminology and how that relates to the experience of miscarriage. So there's a bunch of different terms. And unfortunately, and I try to remind patients of this, if I have time to talk about it, that in the medical vernacular, we use the term abortus or yeah. abortion, not for a voluntary termination of pregnancy, which is what we've now kind of colloquially used the term abortion for, but, um, but for any miscarriage. So a missed abortion is where the, the pregnancy stopped itself, yeah. but it didn't come out. Yeah. Whereas an incomplete is where you've started bleeding heavily and part of the tissue comes out and a complete is where it all comes out. And again, we typically say missed abortion, incomplete abortion and complete abortion. And it's important to know that only because you might see it in your chart or you might see it on your bill. And then it's very upsetting to patients because that word is so triggering. Sure. So I think it's kind of good to know that as a background for the listeners, but yeah. So that means that you had a miscarriage, but in, in typical, um, in the, in the typical world, we think of miscarriages where we bled and everything came out. Yeah. So you didn't bleed and things didn't come out. You just had the missed miscarriage. Yes. And I think that is, that's the first thing that really um, was hard to understand because then I was just like, oh my gosh, I've been carrying around this like dead, like baby for three weeks in my body and I've been doing all these things, acting like everything's okay. I had no idea. And it's like this really weird head trip to just think about like, you thought you were pregnant for like this amount of time and you're not. And like, it just, 
And um, so the next part of it is what I uh, had a problem with is that the doctor was like, okay, so you might bleed a little bit for the next like month or so until you start your cycle, just like spotting, like, um, and you know, but if you're in pain, let us know, or if you start filling up like, um, more than a pad every two hours, let us know, but did not give me any other details as to what the experience could be like, and just like sent me home. Yeah. That's, that is, I'm going to stop you there and say, well, two things I want to say. One, um, I think it's very natural. And I think the hardest ones are when patients walk into the office, either having just had a little bit of spotting or have no idea. And we have to tell them they had a miscarriage because just to your point, you've been up until then, like you didn't even fathom that that could happen. And it's so upsetting. Um, two is that thankfully it's not dangerous at all. Right. I think it's very natural for women to be like, oh my gosh, now I've been carrying this tissue inside for three extra weeks, but I do want everyone to know if they don't know that it's not, luckily it's not dangerous. It's very upsetting but there's no danger in it or harm. Yeah. But what that doctor said, unfortunately, and I never want to throw any doctor under bus because I always no, say it, sometimes it's the doctor saying the wrong things. And sometimes it's the patients just in their stress and anxiety, not interpreting it. But it sounds like she didn't prepare you for the truth, which is if it had already grown to six weeks to pass a six week tissue, like to pass that much, because, you know, the little, the little fetal pole, we call it at six weeks is very small. It's only less than two centimeters but the surrounding sac and the tissue, it's a lot. And it's a, you, your cervix has to dilate. It is, she shouldn't say you're just going to be spotting or bleeding. Like I tell patients, it's going to be like the heaviest period you've ever had with pretty intense cramping. And frankly, if it's not heavy, then that means the tissue is not coming out. And then we'd have to look again. And so I, I feel like that was a disservice. <laughs> I'm sorry. On behalf of the medical community that that For happened. Sure. I, I, and it's, it's interesting too, because I, um, I don't know if this is just like a cultural thing, like North versus South. Like, I, I, being from New England, I like people to be direct with me. I want all the information. I don't want you to like baby me at all. And this doctor was like talking to me like this, and just, and I'm like, I need you to just like be straight up with me. And she was just being like too gentle. <laughs> And I'm like, well, and I'd like to believe that she could be super light, nice and gentle and loving, but actually accurate yes. <laughs> because I mean, cause all joking is that it's so important for you to know, you know, what's going to happen because if you're not prepared for that, that can be really nerve wracking and truly scary. Quote unquote. Yeah, right? I, I had no idea, I had no idea. So then I, I went home. Um, and then around one o'clock in the morning, I started getting the worst cramps I've ever had in my life. Just like pain that I couldn't even talk through. And, and I feel like I have a generally high tolerance for pain, but this was like next level. I was like throwing up and had also like the craziest diarrhea, like mm -hmm. the entire time for like three hours, basically. Yeah. And so, I'm but like, this was not with medication. They gave you medication, or this was for it to pass on its own. To pass on its own. Yeah. Um, and I didn't understand that. I was like, oh my god, what's wrong with me? And like called and got someone, you know, overnight. And they're like, oh, that's from your hormones dropping. I was like, no one told me. <laughs> like this could be. So I'm like stuck on the toilet. Oh, growing up while going through diarrhea and it like in a dark way it's like very macabre but you're just like this is so humbling yeah. oh yeah <laughs> position um but then I started passing like really big clots um like bigger clots than I've ever passed like probably the size of like a half dollar or something um and so this was from like one to four in the morning, straight through like no break, constant cramping. And then um, I, I felt the tissue kind of like, whoosh, just like okay. push out. And also I, I wasn't, I, that was such a head trip as well, because you're like, what do I do with this? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and they had said to me like, we can give you a box that you can put it in if you want to have it tested. And I'm like, how am I going to get this out of the water? Like, I'm not trying to be um, the dramatic or anything. I just, these are things that no one told me. Like I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about like, how do you retrieve it? I, I'm like, I'm not going to stick my hands in here. And so you're, you're just, you know, having to process that and like, it's just a lot. And then, um, 
So then later that afternoon, um, I thought it was all over and then it started all over again for, for like another three hours, that same level of pain and clotting what was passing. And then it was finally like over. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just like, I, my mom had had three miscarriages before she had me. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the back of my mind, I kind of always knew maybe that could be a possibility because of my thyroid issue. And, um, but I also thought, oh, my mom has a, like a ton of autoimmune diseases and she had an inverted uterus and like she has a negative blood type and like all these different things. And I don't have that. So maybe it won't happen to me. Um, but she, her experience was like much more mild than mine for each one of hers yes. and um so she was kind of shocked by what i was telling her i had gone through and like you were saying everyone is so different and how they process this but so that was that was my experience the first time second time was dnc so completely different um because was, you and was a dnc the second time because you chose to do that because of your first experience yeah i i was i think that was i was just like when they told me that there wasn't a heartbeat that time, I immediately was freaking out because I was like, I can't do this again. Like, I can't, I cannot, like the fear of going through that again at home was just like, I can't, I can't do it. Um, right. And we also did want to be able to have the tissue tested and see, and there were abnormal chromosomes with it. So we are like, okay. And you know, my OB was like, you know, these are completely incompatible with life. Like there's no way that this would have ever survived like yes. a complete pregnancy. Right. Um, so on one hand, it felt good to know that. On another hand, like, you know, like they sent me up with a genetic counselor and she's like, we can test you both to see if like you're compatible. And I'm like, I don't want to know that. I don't want to know that like we maybe can't have kids together because we're not. <laughs> well, but just to be specific, Okay, two things I think are good for historical reference. In the past, up until about five to eight years ago, the guidelines said that do not do any workup at all for current miscarriages or for current pre pregnancy loss unless someone has had three in a row yeah. before you do a workup. Now, most of us at two would do it because we felt bad. Yeah, but I yeah. said to every patient, I'm glad that I can tell you that up until three, it's considered within the realm of norm. We don't mm -hmm. even need to do a workup. Of course, I'll offer it to you because I fully understand it. But if you don't want to, you don't need to, and we can be hopeful. And I have to say, a lot of those women, most of those women went on to get pregnant. Yeah. During the workup, what you're talking about is that the genetics counselor, if they get involved, some do, some don't. It just depends on your doctor or where you do the, the workup. Like I actually often send my patients for recurrent pregnancy loss to like the fertility doctor because we have great ones around here and it's just easier. Yeah. But it's not that you and your your husband, or as I joke, like new, you and the father of the baby or the sperm donor would be incompatible. It's just that sometimes there are subtle things that can make it harder or you or your husband might carry what are called balanced translocations, meaning abnormal chromosomes that you got through life being very balanced with because everything else in your body worked. And so just to be clear, like then the answer could be IVF. So it's not that it would be total incompatibility. It would just be something that could be addressed with more scientific means, you know? Which is interesting because that's something that also wasn't explained because I basically repeated back to her like, okay, so the point of like us, if we were to do this is we would find out whether or not like we can like naturally have children together. And if, if, if the answer is no, then that's kind of it. And she was like, basically, yeah. <laughs> And so, well, I don't know. Did she, okay. When you say, can you naturally have babies together? Meaning let's say for the sake of argument, one of two things she might discover. One is that she probably was also going to do a panel of, of recessive genetic tests, which once you get pregnant, there are certain genetic tests we have to check for. The most common one that people have heard of is cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a gene that any of us might carry. And ideally you're better off finding it out before you even get pregnant. Mm -hmm. But the conundrum is insurance companies don't always cover it beforehand. It's very annoying. So those genes she potentially would have checked. And let's say you and he both carried a recessive gene. So you're fine. One in four of your pregnancies could carry both recessive genes and then actually have cystic fibrosis, right? So let's say that happens because that happens worldwide from time to time. Then you see the fertility doctor. They take your eggs and his sperm, they create embryos, and then they find which embryos don't carry both of those defective genes. Separately, like I said, there could be just your own chromosomes being irregular. And again, you could still get pregnant with him, but maybe with a lot more scientific involvement. So I wonder if she misinterpreted what you meant as 
like natural meaning, I don't want any intervention. And if you're saying, uh, so I don't know. And this is a good example of, unfortunately, as the doctor, you, I think you have to be, the burden is on us to be really compulsive in making it clear, like what we're saying and what, what your understanding is of it. And sometimes yeah. that requires a few different times of repetition because it's so easy in that moment to just be like, well, I mean, I don't know. The patient said she didn't want any intervention. So, you know, I offered and she said, no. But the yeah. honest answer is maybe the patient didn't really understand because this stuff is confusing. I think it's probably like a, a team effort, right? And that like, um, as, as a vocal coach, like teacher, I, I try to always talk to students, at least when we're first working together, as if they don't know anything at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, let me just tell you all of the things. And if you've already heard some of this stuff, you can stop me, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I feel like it would have been nice to, yeah, have that from her. Also too, I have so much more knowledge like a year out now than I did back then. And I feel like I would have been able to ask better questions during right. that consultation now than I did then too. So you're right. I'm sure it's like, all of the things, it's a perfect story. <laughs> but it's too bad, right? Because, and it's good actually for me as the doctor to continue to hear these stories so that we can try to continue to improve how we communicate with patients, right? And I, and I would say to patients out there and to women out there, I think the onus has to be on both parties, right? Like we as the, as the doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners have to be better about communicating. And as patients, you just unfortunately have to very, um, you have to reassert yourself, which is frustrating, yeah. but you have to do that, unfortunately, because while that genetics counselor is probably really good and really nice, but she's talking to 12 patients that day, or if she's a doctor, she's talking to 30 patients that day. Mm -hmm. And so that's the hard part, right? Because you, I really wish for each woman that they didn't have to be assertive and advocate for themselves, but that would be a disservice if I said to each of you, like, you don't need to do that because that's what we're here for. And in an ideal world, that is what we're here for, but it's just the system is so imperfect that if the, the patients don't advocate for themselves and the doctors and practitioners don't improve how they deliver information, we won't ever be able to really meet, have a really impactful understanding, you know? Yeah. And I, I do think that it is, um, you know, as frustrating as it can be, I do feel like it's fostered this relationship with my body that I didn't have before. Um, and thinking about my health in a really like critical way um, and uh, just being a lot more involved in my overall care than I was mm -hmm. before these miscarriages as well, mm -hmm. which I think has been a really great thing. So, I mean, you know, I, I would like to think that I would have gotten there without having to go right. this. Right. We don't need these reminders, God, whoever's out there. Yes, totally. Um, but the, the next thing I'd love to get into too is like um, sort of the physical fallout um, and, and uh, kind of how that can look for different people coming out of miscarriage. I know for me physically, I just wrote down a bunch of things so I wouldn't forget, but like um, I bled, like I spotted for about a month after each and luckily my period started like exactly a month after. Um, but I felt like my insides were kind of like float floaty for a little while. Like mm -hmm. if I jumped, I kind of felt stuff just didn't feel like it was in place. Mm -hmm. um, had, had like really bad headaches for about six weeks. Felt like I was bloated for months afterwards. And then all of it kind of um, capitulated and like extreme health anxiety um, resulting in like panic attacks, hospital visits, because I thought I was like having a heart attack, just like really um, dizziness, numbness, like all of these things that took kind of mul multiple modalities to deal with. Do you remember any of those things or can you speak on maybe some things your patients yeah. talk to you about with yes. that? Well, first of all, in your case, I'm assuming you've had your thyroid antibodies checked as well yeah. since you've had your thyroid checked. Okay. Just because some of your symptoms definitely sound, they're all hormonal. Mm -hmm. And, and some will be more kind of exaggerated than others, just depending on what else is happening in your body. And it could have been a subtle interplay between your pregnancy hormones and your thyroid. And, and this is something really important. I think for patients to know when your doctor, whether it's me or someone or your other doctors, right. Say, Oh, everything was normal. Your blood test was normal. Your hormones were normal. What we really should say. And I try to say, and I hope I do a decent job, at least the majority of the time is these are the things we can measure on paper. And I'm so glad to say that there's nothing glaringly wrong on paper. Mm -hmm. That said, it doesn't mean that everything within your body is interacting optimally, right? Yeah. Your hormones are a very complicated, complicated cascade and dance, and they interact with each other. And so the misconception is, 
well, there's, there's nothing wrong with me that they can find, which means there must be something else wrong. When in reality, the honest answer is there's nothing wrong with you. We found that everything is okay that we can measure. And that just means that there are other things that we cannot measure, but that are not dangerous or wrong. So far, we have been able to luckily through medicine, figure out like the most dangerous things typically, right? Yeah. So all those symptoms you described, like typically what happens is your pregnancy, the hormone levels will start to decline or taper off. And then, and that's the, pre, the HCG hormone. So things like if you were nauseated, it suddenly stops. If your breasts were really tender from the progesterone, that will stop. Your estrogen levels drop. You'll get a bad headache that gets precipitated by the drop in estrogen, just like before a period that some women get. So those are all very classic symptoms, like all of a sudden dissipation of nausea or breast tenderness, all of a sudden getting a, a headache precipitated. The reason you had the diarrhea was because if your uterus starts to contract, the prostaglandin that gets released, which is that hormone, the prostaglandin then reacts with your bowels because those are also a muscle and the prostaglandin makes the uterine muscle and the bowel muscles contract. And then you could get diarrhea. Um, the anxiety is a hard one to say, because I think some people experience it and some don't, and it could be purely, um, I hate the word emotional, but purely emotional, right? Because you're reflecting, yeah. thinking, God, my body just, you know, I hate, I hate that this happens, but I think it happens for a lot of women. We take on the burden of my body failed me. And somehow we think that that's like a character flaw or a character judgment, right? On the yeah. flip side, hormones can absolutely precipitate anxiety. I mean, any of us who have had marked PMS, I mean, I used to be able to joke that before my ovaries were removed at age 46, five years ago, I could time when I was going to get my period based on how much I was gritting my teeth and wanting to like bludgeon the members of my family. Right. And that would happen two or three days before my period. And it was very physically apparent to me that that was my hormones dropping. Right. So you had massive hormone fluctuations from the miscarriages. Um, so none of what you said shocks me, though. I'm glad that I can say, I think some of yours um, were a little bit more intense than what many women will experience. So, and again, I say this not jokingly, I almost think that my body just doesn't have time to go through that stuff because I was like literally back at work the next day. And, you know, and that's not good necessarily either. I mean, I am sure I have not processed these miscarriages, right? I mean, no, I joke, I just buried them down deep. That's such a good point though, too, because I, I do think that there is something to being able to focus on something else and not, not to gloss over or not right. really process what's happened. But I think when you are mid pandemic and you can't go anywhere mm -hmm. and you're stuck at home and you can't even see like your friends, yeah. uh, all you have are your thoughts. And so I was just constantly spiraling. I had too much time to think. Also, yeah. Yeah, my, my Hashimoto's was like way flared up. My teeth. Oh, honey. Well that, okay. That's what I mean. So, so yeah. just for everyone who's listening, if Danny has Hashimoto's, which means that she has some um, fluctuations in her thyroid where it'll be hyper or hypo, meaning high or low, that was definitely, um, that probably was triggered by the pregnancy as well. Right. There's yeah. no way to prove that, but we see that any stressful situation could do it. And that's probably why you had such extreme kind of highs and lows and things like that. But no, yeah. I agree. Listen, I don't spend a lot of time at home, like kind of without a lot of things to do typically, which is on one hand exhausting on the other hand, but the few times I had like idle time, I can feel myself becoming very like that physical feeling of anxiety and a little bit of like that moody sadness. Yeah. So I do think many of us, again, like you said, to your point, not snowing ourselves by keeping busy, but I think that many of us have very active minds and we can tend to use that for, you know, for good or for evil, right. <laughs> like over, overthink things. Yes. Um, there was something else you had said, tell me. So you had said, cause one of the things I wanted to address, you had said about the mood. Oh yeah. What were the other ones? There was. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, really bad headaches, bloated for a long time. Um, oh, you said about your body feeling like it was sloshing inside. Yeah. Yeah. So the one thing that that could have been, cause that's not a typical complaint, but when you're pregnant, whether it's a miscarriage or a, or a, you know, viable pregnancy that's going to go on, you will often get a cyst in your ovary called the corpus luteum cyst. And that mm. cyst provides progesterone to the pregnancy until about 10 or 12 weeks when the placenta takes over. So I wonder if at the same time, coincidentally, you just had that cyst burst because that will be pretty painful. And it'll also, the fluid will make it feel like your organs are kind of sloshing against themselves or like, you'll feel like pain when you're going over the bumps in the road and things like that. Because I would say that one is not a common one that we hear. Okay. Yeah. That's super interesting. Like, I think also too, again, like, because I was like at home alone in my thoughts, sometimes I wonder how many of my symptoms were like real and how many of them I was like, 
Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that's very natural, right? And listen, I say to patients, patients will say to me all the time about any complaint, pregnancy related or not, do you think it's just anxiety? Do you think it's in my mind? And what I say all the time is, listen, here's the God's honest truth. As humans, and especially as women, our minds are amazing, right? Our minds can do powerful things, again, good and not good. So there are times where I think it's possible that it was anxiety. It's possible that it was you know, psychosomatic, but there's no way to prove that. And I really feel that the burden should be on us to disprove the, the very clear medical entities that we can disprove before we default to, oh, honey, it's just in your mind, right? Yeah. Because that yeah. only serves to um, disconnect you as, as people from the medical system, disconnect you from your doctor or nurse or midwife or whoever, and make you almost feel like you either don't trust yourself or like your doctors don't trust your body, right? And so- yeah. Listen, could you have been like, could have those things have been in your mind? Maybe, but it doesn't mean you're making those things up. It means that your body is processing whatever it's feeling and creating a physical response to that. And, and that happens, right? And that's important to decide, to discuss and to try to ferret out, but there's sometimes no way to prove it. And I don't think we should just kind of default to that because that's not really, that's not fair. That's, that's such a good point too. I, I do feel like I have, I've assembled a good team around yeah. me that, I feel very heard. I feel like they're always trying to get to the root of stuff. And it's not just like, I have a functional practitioner that I see who manages my thyroid now. And um, luckily for my last visit, all my blood work looked the way that it should for Hashimoto's and everything. But also too, when you were talking about processing, um, I think in terms of like healing from this uh, uh, kind of on, on the whole, I there's a lot of things that have worked for me, are there things that you kind of recommend to patients as to like, hey, these are some mindset things to keep in mind or try to practice or? Yeah, I mean, again, listen, it's so, it's, I think, as I always say about everything, right? About birthing, about being a human, about all the things. We're all so different. So I really want to be mindful of that. And I think one of the worst things we do as doctors is kind of dogmatically act like, this is the answer. <laughs> and then people are like, well, that didn't work for me. There must be something yeah. wrong, right? Um, so I really want to be clear to anyone listening. These are not the answers. These are the answers that I have found worked for me and that when I've gently suggested them to like my patients over the last 22 years, I'm glad that a lot of them have come back later and been like, remember when you said that? It was really meaningful and I didn't realize it at the time. And now, now here's the truth. Maybe I said things that people were like, I hated when you said that and they didn't <laughs> want to tell me. And that's honest, right? So I'll just put that out there. Um, what I try not to do is kind of like all the classic answers that we hear when we have a miscarriage that sound pat to me, right? That just sound like just placations. There's actually truth in them, but at the moment they sound like placations. Like I try not to be like, this is just nature's way of taking care of things that, because the truth is you and I know that like, and as I always joke, like why did nature screw up in the first place and then have to fix itself? Why didn't it just not just screw up in the first place? But it, whatever that happens. But in that moment, like I, I try to really highlight optimism because as you know, I'm an optimistic person while also highlighting the, the crap. You know, I always say like, I try to find the beauty within the sock and I don't want to sugarcoat things. This has nothing to do with like glasses half full. Let's look at the bright side. Cause that is just a way of furthering shame and blame because then we really, really tampon odd things and don't really highlight them. But I think we can all at once say going through miscarriage sucks. I mean, there's no two ways about it. It sucks. I mean, being a woman is so beautiful and such a burden all in one. And I'm so grateful to be a woman. I have zero desire to be a man in any way, but I also feel deeply um, sad <laughs> for what we have to weather. It is yeah. a massive um, undertaking of pressure that anyone who hasn't gone through miscarriages or challenging pregnancies or challenging deliveries or anything just doesn't understand. And sometimes I'm, I'm glad for them. They don't understand it. I'm deeply happy for women who choose not to go through this. And I mean that genuinely, like, I don't think that makes them selfish. I don't think that means they're not good mothers. I think it means they're choosing not to go through it. And they're probably very self-aware and I applaud them. And I think they can be just as happy in different ways. But I think that in that moment, what I try to really remind women is this sucks so bad right now, but I do want to be that little bee like in your, in your bonnet that just reminds you that this does not define you. First of all, this is not your fault because I think we all go to like, <gasps> was it that I thought I wasn't even want to be pregnant or was it that one time I like had a glass of wine or was it the sex or was it the whatever? And it's none of those. Like it's so hard to cause a miscarriage. Um, and I really try to remind them you will have a baby period. This is so sad that this is not the one that you're going to have because this is the one you thought you wanted, but you will have a baby. And I think I can say that with really good confidence, not only because the majority of women, I mean, data shows this, right? The vast majority of women will go on to have a spontaneous pregnancy that is healthy and full term. 
And I always joke with women, like, forget that I'm trying to be emotional. I could be a cold hearted snake and I'd still be able to say to you, oh, you're going to have a baby. That's true. Secondly, if you're willing to, to let your brain go out even farther to, I'll either have a baby because I'll get pregnant on my own spontaneously, or I'll seek help from my doctor or a fertility specialist. So I think if you're willing to acknowledge the breadth of choices, then it makes it easier to kind of optimistically go, oh, okay, so you're telling me I'm going to be okay and I'm going to have a baby. The journey between here and there is going to suck a little bit maybe, or it's going to be beautiful or shades of all. But I think that what happens in that moment is as a woman, all we think of is, I want to be pregnant. I wanted to be pregnant now. This was supposed to be my baby. And I don't want any more heartache and I don't want to go through anything. And then it becomes a lot of, what if I don't get to do it? When in reality, I always say to patients like, well, why would you not be able to do it? I'm confused. Like we live in 2022. We have a lot of things at our fingertips. I get that you don't want to have to go to a fertility doctor, right? Like nobody really wants to have to go. I get all that, but we're also mature adults. We've all been through stuff. We've all been through things in our past. And if we remind ourselves of all those things we've been through, that we've survived and that we've gotten through and that now we barely even remember the details of, it really can set the stage for you feeling absolutely sad and try to process it and acknowledge that it sucks and all those things and still clear-headedly not let yourself like go into a place that is fatalistic or catastrophic, right? Because I do think we all tend to do that a little bit. And I, I really think that if preemptively before you can get pregnant, you can remind yourself, this is the beginning of a journey. Mm. Ideally, it's gonna go smoothly. Realistically, it's probably not. There's going to be little blips along the road, but the end result is I will mother if that is what I'm choosing to do. Mm -hmm. And it might be a different route than I thought and a different journey than I thought, just like labor, just like life, but I will get through it. And I think setting your intention to that preemptively would be so good and not in a negative, like, you know, you might have a miscarriage because that sounds terrible, but just in a realistic, like, listen, I wish I could sugarcoat it and be like, you're going to get pregnant. It's going to be easy. It's going to be fun delivery. And then life is going to be like, just filled with blossoms as a mother. But that's just, we know that's not true. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more work as women, this is why tribe called V is existing actually, because the more work we can do to preemptively teach people things so that they don't in that moment have to either Google or catastrophize because that's because in that moment, your emotions and your hormones are going to wrangle your brain. You got to wrangle that brain before it wrangles you. I always say, you know, Yes, that, uh, yeah, the whole just like being able to sort of zoom out and get that perspective is such a, I feel like it's such a trained thing to mm -hmm. build in ourselves and choosing that, like how you're going to respond to a situation or choosing how you're going to enjoy your life as it is right now in this moment and learning to trust the process of the unfolding of your life as like, Woo -woo, whatever as it sounds. But I don't think that's woo, woo. I mean, I have to say, I, I say this all the time, but it is so easy to be grateful and be like filled with all the love on Christmas morning when you're sitting around in abundance, right? Of like breakfast and gifts. It is much harder, but so much more impactful. If in the moment that you've experienced that sucky, sucky, sucky thing, you find the beauty within that suck in that moment. And yeah. I'm not suggesting that the minute you've been told you have a miscarriage and you're hemorrhaging, <laughs> Kevin yeah. Diarrhea, that you're going to find the beauty, but actually I am suggesting that the more you can train yourself to, to not gloss, gloss over the bad parts, mm -hmm. but also say, oh my gosh, thank God I'm here with, you know, my husband who I love, or thank God I am a, you know, white woman in America who actually will be able to advocate for herself, whatever it is, whatever it is, right? Like when I got diagnosed with ovarian cancer, it sucks. My bladder got perforated during my surgery. I had like all these complications, but I mean this. I didn't ever gloss over those. I acknowledge those things stunk, but I, cl I very clearly forced myself to remind myself of all the things that I was so deeply grateful for because it's a habit that I've really honed. And I found that it's helped so much. And I think that the younger we start, young women and men, um, saying these things and, and embedding that into their brain. So that, like their frontal lobe really understands those neural connections. Cause it's not something we're taught, right? We're very much taught, like you lead by example. So we see strong people getting through things, but we have no idea of the process as to how they get through things. And the truth is many of them just get through it by continuing to survive, but their brain is not thriving. Mm -hmm. And what we yeah. really want, right. Is to survive it and actually thrive and say, gosh, the life is hard and beautiful all in one. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, this is a whole other, this is a whole other podcast, but I think something else too, for anyone else who's listening to this, who comes from a similar background, I was raised born again, Christian. It's like mm -hmm. very intense and a lot 
um, a, a running theme is kind of like the devil is behind everything. There's deeper Ooh. meaning to everything. Yeah. And, you know, like you're always being like persecuted against. You're always having like trials that are being presented to you as a way of like God kind of making you prove your your loyalty to him or whatever. And even though I've deconstructed a lot of that and healed from that and I'm on like a very, what feels to me like peaceful and healthy spiritual journey now, um, I think part of my brain that I've also had to rewire through this process is like understanding that sometimes things just happen. And oh gosh. No deeper meaning. It just happens and that is what it is and that's okay and I don't need to dig deeper and try to find the meaning behind everything and like you know that it's yeah I agree well listen as someone who was raised not at all religious like in a very agnostic I would say my mother was very spiritual meaning she kind of believes in God I very much believe in God but I don't know if this helps everyone who's listening I have always said this I am deeply connected to this being that I happen to call God. It's maybe not the same God as like the three big religions, but it's a spiritual being on the other side. I really believe and have had experiences through mediums and other people that there is life or some experience after we pass on this earth. And what I always say is, I believe that if there is a spirit like God, he or she has far bigger fish to fry. He or yeah. she is not there being yeah. like, ah, Shiva and Danny, I got to teach them a lesson, right? <laughs> he's not teaching anyone a lesson. In fact, I think that he's like, he's going to, we're going to get to the other side and he's going to be like, yeah, do you know that that earthly existence was not as big a as existence as you thought it was? It's a small part. I think how we respond to things here does inform maybe how we kind of spiritually cross over. I don't know, but I don't think anyone is afflicting us. I don't believe in God being that, that evil or, or mean or vindictive or narcissistic to afflict yeah. us. Right. Mm -hmm. And I always say our body is just a vessel like anything else. It is just going to unfortunately succumb to physical mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. Like miscarriages, like cancer. If we take everything, like you said, as, oh my gosh, this was like some karmic resolution of something. Yes. I mean, but I think how we respond really does make a difference, right? Yeah. And so, and if nothing else, it makes a difference because it helps us feel better on this earth. Yeah. Know? Completely, completely. I, yeah, it's really shifted my mindset to be able to now I feel like when I'm, I can feel some kind of, I don't know, depressive episode or anxious episode coming on, or even just dealing with things professionally, I'm able to be like, okay, girl, you have been through some stuff. Like, you know, <laughs> you know what this is going to feel like, but you also know that you can choose how you're going to respond to this and let yourself feel the things you need to feel, but also like, you know that you have this option you can go to of like find that gratitude wherever you can and right. keep it moving, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think what's really important, I know we have to go in a sec, but to highlight, I was speaking to someone recently who I deeply adore and love. And she said, um, if she's listening, she'll know. She said, well, I was raised to just put on a happy face and that everything's going to be okay. And sometimes I just feel sad. I don't want to do that. And I said, I think that this person thought that that is kind of how I comport myself because I tend to be an optimist. And I said, well, let me be as painfully clear as I can be. That is not my intention or my way or what I would encourage for anyone. I would never say, just put on a happy face and like, let's just express gratitude ever. I would actually say the opposite. I would say, let us really delve deep into the, the crap that's happening while also acknowledging the things that are good and what we do have choice in right? Mm -hmm. Like we know there's things we cannot control. Those things are out of our control. We know that there are things we can control, but none of this has to do with like fakely put on a putting on a happy face. In fact, I think the only way we can do what you and I clearly want to do is by being incredibly transparent and raw and very open, like a la Brene Brown, like really, mm -hmm. really be vulnerable. So yeah. I think that putting on a happy face is the wrong thing. I don't want to put on a happy face. I want to actually feel happy because I have so opened up and told everyone my crap that I can kind of heal from it just by sharing it and bonding yeah. and maybe learning and then maybe teaching, right? So it's a very different mindset, but I think it's really easy to misinterpret what you and I want to do as like, you're just talking about, you know, the glass is half full and oh, that's not yeah. at all. No, not at all. What's that saying? Like the only way out is through, you yeah. know, and, and that's really more of what it is. It's like, you have worked for that happiness. It's mm -hmm. not yeah, like, exactly. well, I'm happy. <laughs> Yeah. You know, like you've learned to find it and appreciate it when you have it. And yeah, it's it's a definitely a, a relationship building kind of thing you have to do with 
how you process. Yeah. Um, but really quick before we go, I would love to have you just tell everybody about Tribe Called V. Well, I love Tribe Called V. So Tribe Called V, and by the way, my background is a little bit jumbled right now because we have my Tribe Called V artwork, but this, this side is all of the stuff that Jenny and I are working on. So Jenny Hayes Edwards is my business partner and she approached me two and a half years ago now when she was about to embark on her pregnancy journey because she was going to be 45. Mm -hmm. She had her frozen eggs from when she was 35 that she had turned into embryos with her, her husband later. Um, and then she said, let's create a pregnancy course and really inform women about this through my journey of becoming pregnant. And we did. So now we have a pregnancy course that's actually going to launch in early March, 2022. So it's coming up in a couple of weeks because she's been editing it and her baby just turned a year. She was 46 almost when she birthed her beautiful baby from her again, 35 year old frozen eggs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, her journey is also very circuitous and yet here she is. Um, and then we're going to build up our gynecology content. So basically Tribe Called V is an online platform that is digital, that involves information for women. And we always say we want to increase their knowledge to decrease their anxiety. Because just like you and I've talked about, I think the biggest sources of anxiety come from the unknown. And yes. when there's unknown, we catastrophize, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I didn't know I could have a miscarriage. Or, oh my God, I heard, I heard I could have one. I didn't think I could have two. This must mean there's something wrong. I can't have a baby. I must be getting punished, whatever it is, right? So the more we preemptively give humans knowledge about their body and their health, the less anxious they're going to be and the more they're able to really collaborate with their providers. So the whole purpose of us doing it is not only to help women and patients, but to help doctors, <laughs> because I feel like I always joke, like I'm on everyone's side. Like I want you to be able to go into your doctor's office and her tell you, you have HPV on your pap smear and you not have to default to like, Oh my God, death and destruction. Does not mean someone cheated? Does not mean I'm going to die of cervical cancer? Does not mean all the bad things I want you to have been able to read or hear about cervical about HPV through Tribe Called V. So when your doctor calls you or sends you a message, you're like, oh yeah, I've heard about that. 90% of us have it. Not a big deal. You know, yeah. I'm totally okay with it. So we're really going to debunk all the things. I mean, I always say all the pregnancy issues, but also HPV, herpes, endometriosis, PCOS, perimenopause, menopause, cancer screening, all of those things. And because I've had my miscarriages, my ovarian cancer, and you know, my oldest son had an intrauterine stroke and many, many other health things that I've been through. And I don't say it flippantly like, yeah, they were all fine. Again, they all, they each and every one of them sucked in so many ways, but each and every one also informed me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always joke that like, if I looked forward when I was 26 to all the crap I would have gone through from 26 to 46, I would have been like, no, thanks. I'll get <laughs> off here. But now I, I, I really truly feel that I am genuinely lucky. And I don't mean that in a flippant way. I feel I've created a great life, but I've also been privy to certain things that I wouldn't have been privy to had I not gone through those experiences. So, so everyone can come over to tribe called V on Instagram and sign up for our email list. So you can hear all the new things. And if you're pregnant or trying to conceive, you can join our pregnancy program. We do two live zooms a month and we have an ebook. And then the course is going to be launching in March for all of us as, as humans, it's really important for those of us who have either children or nieces or nephews or friends, children to help them decrease their anxiety at a younger age than maybe we were all explicitly taught, right? Like I was very implicitly taught to be strong, but I was not explicitly explained how to do certain things, how to create a different mindset, how to not over-dramatize and not catastrophize. And I think that that's really valuable. I don't think leading by example is, is it. I think mm -hmm. it's necessary, but not sufficient. I think we can do better by really explicitly training people about what to do with their brains. Which is what I feel like you've been so amazing at doing on your Instagram. I mean, like one of the things that was so helpful for me was that I think it was like a six part series you did on miscarriage on your Instagram um, yeah. lives. And um, so for anyone listening, totally follow Shiva. You will learn so much. She's an amazing resource. Join Tribe Called V. Thank you so much for taking time out of, I know your insane schedule and um, delivering babies and educating us on our bodies. And like, you're, you're just the best. And I'm so grateful for you. Well, I love you. Thank you so much. All right, love. I really All right appreciate honey, thank you. you so much. Okay. So part three of first time experiencing miscarriage. This is a very layered process. And I just wanted to do like an addendum to the first two parts, um, telling my story and then speaking with Shiva. We didn't really talk too much about healing. And I really think that that's so important because it's so easy to dwell on the trauma of miscarriage. But I think knowing that there is a 
returning to yourself after going through something like this. There is an expansion of yourself that takes place if you're willing to really meet yourself in this process and let yourself feel all the things you need to feel, you know, that that's saying the only way out is through. And that's what I've found personally with this process. Um, so some of the things that I have found to be really healing for me uh, have been finding people who have experienced this, who know exactly what I'm feeling. Maybe they didn't have an exact, um, it didn't play out for them in the exact same way. But when I came across Shiva's videos as a medical professional, treating miscarriage that really helped educate me uh, but made me feel so much less alone and finding different people like that online has brought me a lot of comfort and i would encourage you to find those resources as well a few books that have really helped me a friend of mine sent me a book called spirit babies by walter uh, mackichin if i'm saying that correctly and it may not be for everyone, but the gist of the book is basically that we are, as women, vessels for spirits to come through. Uh, children are not our own. They choose us. And I think that brought me a lot of comfort, that concept, for some reason. Um, but there are also some really beautiful meditations in that book. And I think it helped me feel connected and also like... I had um, some kind of grieving process because there isn't really a grieving process for miscarriage um, in the way you would grieve a traditional loss when there's a, a body involved. Another book I came across was I Am Here by Ashley Lemieux. And this woman's story is absolutely insane. And she is an incredible woman. and. I felt really seen. I felt like I was given some tools to move forward in my healing as well. So that is a fantastic book. I actually, I also found a lot of comfort in fictional books as well because it gave me some sense of escapism, especially being stuck in the house during COVID and feeling trapped with my own thoughts. Reading something that... Um, for me, it was lighter material that may be, if you find that kind of comfort in murder mysteries, <laughs> go for it. But having something that just took me out of my psych, like, you know, cycle of thoughts that I was stuck in really helped a lot. Um, something else that really helped me in the grieving process that I came across in searching online was the concept of a Jizo statue. And it's a Japanese tradition, which I love. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I really love Japanese culture. I was able to spend some time there um, for music. And basically what the statue is, is I guess, and hopefully I'm getting this correct, but in Japanese culture, babies in utero don't cross over into whatever heaven is. And so this is a way to sort of sneak them in. Okay, let me see if I can actually find the meaning for this because I don't want to mess it up. Okay, this is the article that I first found. According to Buddhist belief, a baby who is never born can't go to heaven, having never had the opportunity to accumulate good karma. But Jizo, a sort of patron saint of fetal demise, can smuggle these half-baked souls to paradise in his pockets. He also delivers the toys and snacks we saw being left at his feet on Mount Koya. Jizo is the UPS guy of the afterlife. So this is from an article in the New York Times called The Japanese Art of Grieving a Miscarriage by uh, Angela Elson. If anyone wants to look that up, I'll put a link to it as well under the YouTube video. So uh, Matt actually got me two Jizo statues for each miscarriage and just having something to hold felt really comforting. I had them out for a while and having something to look at was comforting. Um, I didn't really feel like I, lately I haven't felt like I've needed to have them out so I've put them away. But some people will put them out in their, their garden and you can basically treat it however you want to treat it. It's just a way to have something tangible because miscarriage can often feel very intangible 
again, that goes, that's dependent on what stage you miscarry. Um, in terms of physical healing, exercise to whatever capacity you feel capable. I know for me, that's really shifted a lot in terms of really having to listen to what my body has needed. Some days it's HIIT workouts, other days it's running. Some days it's just going for a walk. Some days it's yoga. Grounding yoga practices in particular, I have found. You can just YouTube grounding yoga practices and a bunch will come up. Nico Marie has some really nice grounding practices. I'll link a couple of ones that I really enjoy. And then travel has also been huge. I am so passionate about travel and I feel like I am the truest version of myself, the best version of myself when I travel and being able to get out into the world a little bit again has really helped me reconnect with who I am because I really feel like I lost a lot of myself in this process and it just really helped bring me back to myself. Tapping. If you haven't heard of EFT tapping, basically tapping stimulates your vagus nerve, calms your immune system, and taps into cross meridian lines in your body. And so the way that I traditionally do is it start at the top of my head, tap the crown, then you move down to between your eyebrows, then the side of your ocular bones, underneath your ocular bone, underneath your nose, above your top lip, under your bottom lip on your chin, and then under your collarbones. If you want to, you can also do this outside of your arm just below your wrist, and then also like the outside of your armpits as well. And even if you just do that with no mantra or anything, it it will calm your nervous system. There's been scientific studies that have been shown to do this. So you don't even need to fully believe it in order for it to work. But I would often put a mantra in there, like I am safe, I am healthy, my body is taking care of me, my body is working for me. And that would really help me when I was going through intense bouts of anxiety. And then the last sort of spiritual practice that really has helped me so much is Reiki. And to be honest, I for a long time thought Reiki was kind of bullshit. I'm like, it's like massage for your energy. Someone's not even touching you. How is this even real? And then a girlfriend of mine who I actually just did an episode with, I'm so excited to share with you after this. Her name's Anna Tipton. And we went to school together. She's a beautiful singer and music teacher, but she's also a Reiki master. And she had reached out to me early 2021 and was like, hey, I just feel like I'm supposed to give you a Reiki session. If you're open to it, let me know. And at that point I was like, let me try anything. And when I tell you this has been so healing for me, so affirming for me um, on, on levels that I didn't even know I needed affirmation um matt has even said to me that he feels like it's in some ways been more helpful than traditional therapy i would say both are are helpful but i just cannot recommend it enough now i do think you need to find the right person and someone that you really connect with um, for me that's been anna i will link to her social media as well feel free to reach out to her my sessions have actually been remote which i know sounds crazy but you can either have remote sessions or in person. They've just been mind blowing, um, but we'll get into that in my episode that I do about Reiki, first time doing Reiki with Anna. In terms of things that I worked through in therapy, and I talk about this in some other episodes, my therapist had introduced me to this concept of radical acceptance and really trying to find peace in any outcome and relinquishing any control that I was trying to exert over an outcome and finding peace and knowing that like I don't actually have to control every outcome and I think that with miscarriage a lot of times you feel like you have no control and that is one of the things that can feel most stressful um, procreating there really is an element of just let go and let God <laughs> you know let the universe and it's it is pretty like mystical and magical in addition to being scientific but really working on that concept of radical acceptance has helped me a lot also i dug in a lot to 
a fantastic podcast I talk about all the time called Unfuck Your Brain with Cara Lowenthal. Lowenthal. I'm never sure if I'm saying her last name right, but she specializes in thought work and realizing you do have control over your mind. You have control over your responses and learning to try and catch myself when I was in a moment where I felt like I was spiraling and I felt like I didn't have control. And the thing that would really stress me out is thinking more about how my uncontrolled mind was going to respond to a stressful situation. So learning to have some tools in my tool belt to help me when I'm in those spirals or uh, moments of intense anxiety has really proven to be very healing and empowering. In terms of things that you can do moving forward, again, I'm not a medical professional. This is all based on my personal experience with navigating pregnancy and miscarriage. There are a lot of things that we can do for our bodies to support our bodies on the journey to becoming pregnant. And I thought I had been doing some of those things, but then realized there were more things that could support me even further that I just wasn't aware of on this journey just because, you know, maybe I didn't have access to certain uh, information or um, maybe I just wasn't seeking it out in the way that I I thought I was. But a few of those things, modern fertility is a great way to test your hormones, your ovarian reserve, get an idea of what you're working with fertility-wise, even if kids aren't even on your radar. Um, but you think maybe at some point they could be. It's just good to have, the more information you have, the more empowered you can be. Um, Again though, the more information you have, the more anxious you can be as well. So really find, find where that line is for you. If you are actively trying to get pregnant, there's a great book called It Starts With The Egg. And especially for advanced maternal age pregnancy, it's very encouraging to read that you can increase your ovarian reserve, you can increase the quality of your eggs. There are multiple different protocols you can do for that. And that has felt very empowering to take some of those steps and implement some of those things as well. Finding a doctor you really love and getting a complete blood panel done to see what your vitamin D levels are, see um, what your iron levels are. Acupuncture can be great for building up iron. I have some friends who have had some great experiences with acupuncture in terms of fertility. I know there is a place here in Nashville called Encircle because acupuncture can be very expensive and this is a sliding scale spot and it anywhere from 20 to 40 dollars suggested donation. And so it's you work with an acupuncturist and you tell them what you're trying to work on and they will help you out. So yeah, you can find whatever is within your budget I would also say do what's within your means because I think stressing about having to come up with all of this money isn't going to help you on your journey either for your body but for your mind, you know. So doing whatever feels right for you within your means, I would highly encourage that because it's very easy to go into this like, okay, well, I I need to get this thing. I need to pay for that thing. I need to come up with money for this and um, that really stresses me out. A couple of people to follow online. So of course, uh, Shiva Gofrani at Big Love Fierce Juju, uh, incredible resource for women's health. Uh, Also follow her company, Tribe Called V. You can sign up for all the different classes that they offer in fertility and women's health, pregnancy. It's, she's just a wealth of information. Another doctor I love is Dr. Jolene Brighton. And she has an incredible book called Beyond the Pill. And she's an expert in hormone balance and some autoimmune issues. And again, a really great resource, wealth of knowledge. And there is a doula that I follow, Linny Stone. And she has had four losses and just gave birth to a healthy baby girl this year. And the way that she is able to speak about her journey and encourage women has just been so beautiful. And it's been so amazing to see her step into this role as a mother as well and and to see a positive outcome from all of this. Um, Not that you actually have to give birth in order to have a positive outcome too. I think there are many ways to come through miscarriage, whether you have children or not. And be a 
happy, fulfilled person. So just to, to round things off, you know, I think everyone deserves their level of privacy or visibility that they want to have through miscarriage. I will say if you feel like you have the capacity to talk about it, I would really encourage you to do so because I think sharing our stories helps educate people who haven't thought about this before, helps educate people who are looking for resources as they're going through something like this or they want to support someone that they love who's going through something like this. And also it helps, you know, just share that this is a common part of the journey to having a family. Um, You know, statistically one in four women will have a miscarriage and that number is, you know, in some studies I've read has been even higher dependent on if women even know that they've miscarried or not. So this is a very common thing and I think if I knew how common it was, it maybe would have made me feel a little bit better and feeling like I was less alone. But ultimately, the whole point of me doing this episode is to let you know that you are not alone. I know it feels so lonely, but you're not alone. There are a lot of us who unfortunately are part of this club that we never asked to be in, (laughs) but are now members. (laughs) But that doesn't mean we have to be overwhelmed by grief forever and overwhelmed by anxiety and not be able to trust our bodies and there is there is healing to be had here as well and i just really want to to make sure we we end on that note with this episode and i am sending love out to any person who's listening to this who has been through this um just know that you know i may not know who you are but I I think about fellow women who have gone through this a lot and I'm just holding space for you and feel free to reach out to me on Instagram if you're going through something like this and you need resources or you just need an ear. Um, I will respond to whoever I can with what capacity I have. Um, And again, I will link all of the resources I talked about below in this video. Um, Also, when I make the Instagram post for this episode, um, I'll have some links on Instagram as well. But I hope this episode helps some people on their journey through this and helps you feel seen and held and hopefully is a stepping stone to healing for you. So sending you so much love. Okay, so I know this was a long one, but there's just so much to cover on this topic. Honestly, we could probably do a whole series on it, but if you've made it to the end, thank you so much for sticking around. And I'm just so grateful we were able to have Dr. Shiva Gofrani's perspective today. I always feel so empowered after I talk with her or watch any of her videos online. And if you'd like to follow Dr. Gofrani, and you most definitely should, you can do that over on Instagram at Big Love Fierce Juju and at Tribe Called V. You can also sign up for her women's health, fertility, and pregnancy programs on tribecalledv.com. I'll also have links to all of the books, vitamins, people we talked about following on social media, and other resources in links below the YouTube video. So if you need any help finding any of those things, they'll all be there for you to access. Today's special theme song, Affirmations, was provided courtesy of Gray Ziegler, and First Time for Everything is produced by Two Sheila's Productions. I'm not going to sign off with the usual remember it's never too late for your first time because I don't feel it's appropriate for today's episode. I never want anyone to ever have to have a first time with miscarriage, but what I will say is it's never too late to expand our awareness and empathy towards people who might be having a life experience that's hard for us to understand. We can always try to lean in and learn more, and that's what I hope first time for everything is for us. Thank you so much for listening today. Everything's energy flows through me. I got what I need, cause I'm worthy.